Now, let us start G7 Hiroshima Summit related event Rethinking Nuclear Deterrence Approaches for Moving Beyond. This event um, is held in this venue, but it is also live streaming online and it is open to Japan and the rest of the world. In the session, both Japanese and English are used, so there is a simultaneous translation service. So those in the venue, please use the simultaneous translation receiver at your seat. Channel 1 is for Japanese and Channel 2 is English. Please inform you that English translation is available at Channel 2 on the device on the desk. Now, okay. Uh, when you leave this hall, please make sure that you return the receiver at the receptions. And online, uh, the English and Japanese are used for live streaming. Now we would like to have opening address, starting with the uh, governor of Hiroshima Prefecture, uh, Mr. Uh, Yuzaki. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Hidehiko Yuzaki, governor of Hiroshima Prefecture. I am also the president of HOPE, the Hiroshima Organization for Global Peace. And thank you very much for joining us at this event, which is related to the G7 Hiroshima Summit. Uh, this event is co-organized by the Beyond Nuclear Deterrence Working Group that is led by the Harvard the Belfer Center and also Hiroshima Prefecture and HOPE in uh, recent discussions regarding the Ukrainian situation. Nuclear deterrence has attracted much attention, so we aim to elucidate this idea of nuclear deterrence at this venue. Uh, this notion called nuclear deterrence is referred as a theoretical basis to maintain nuclear weapons and it lies at the core of national security policies. Demands for nuclear deterrence and its fortification have increased as the global security environment has become more stringent. More often than before, we hear calls for nuclear deterrence as a necessity for national security. This reality is harsh for those of us who desire to progress toward a world without nuclear weapons. However, uh, we cannot cease our efforts to achieve the ultimate goal and transcend the prevailing circumstances. We must be grounded in reality and rethink nuclear deterrence through diverse perspectives and seek alternatives from a long-term perspective. Our event uh, partner, Beyond the Nuclear Deterrence Working Group is visiting Hiroshima with scholars from 18 countries to rethink nuclear deterrence. Uh, during this event, uh, the scholars from this group and also experts from Japan and scholars across the world are invited to have a discussion and re-evaluate the nuclear deterrence and also present their research on alternative approaches. We are very glad that we have a diverse audience, um, including the public and also student citizens, experts, and researchers. Uh, we are very happy to accept a very a simple question. Uh, the environment is tough, but we hope to work together through diverse perspectives to discover what we can do to advance from nuclear deterrence to a world free of nuclear weapons. Thank you very much. Next. The co-host of this event uh, from Harvard University Belfer Center, uh, we would like to ask the Executive Director Francesca Giovanni to give us an opening address.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. His Excellency Governor Yusaki, I really want to express on behalf of the Belfast Center and the Harvard Kennedy School my deepest gratitude for the warm and kind hospitality that your city has provided to us. This is my second time in Hiroshima, and every time I come, I am amazed and inspired by this thriving city. For me, Hiroshima really is a place of rebirth, is a place of thriving aspirations, ideals, peace values, uh, world views, amid, in fact, a terrible past, like the atomic bombing. But the city, to me, stands also as an uh, incredible reminder that peace, like war, is not inevitable. Peace is a political project, and it requires work and effort every day, as it was required for this city to be rebuilt, rebuilt brick by brick at the end of the terrible bombing. So it takes a sustained effort to achieve what we all hope for, which is global peace. Now, let me mention that after the end of the Cold War, especially for Europeans like me, we believed that we had left the horror of the past behind. After World War II and World War I, we thought that maybe we were done with wars. But of course we were wrong, because the project of peace remained incomplete. And the Ukraine war stands very much as a reminder that we have not done enough for that project. And that project is also now constantly and regularly undermined by real threatening forces. We hear more and more the calls for nuclear threats, the potential use of limited nuclear weapons, and not one day goes by without having to read about nuclear weapons being deployed, nuclear sharing, uh, or calls, for example, for strengthening nuclear deterrence. So there's no doubt that instead of moving forward into this peace project, we are actually moving backward. And we can spend a lot of time just pondering, uh, well, where did we go wrong? Why have we not learned from the past, for 30 years of Cold War, deep nuclear crisis, deep risks? Or we can just look forward and ask, what can we do now? So Harvard University, in partnership with MacArthur uh, Foundation, has launched last year a research network on rethinking nuclear deterrence. This is the largest academic initiative in the field today. It counts over 12 academic institutions over 25 countries and 80 scholars. And the scope of this exercise is to bring academia at the table, to think anew about this peace project that we have left incomplete. And we want to ask the tough questions. Questions that maybe, you know, we thought we answered a while back, but we failed. So can the theory of nuclear deterrence be challenged? Is there an alternative to nuclear weapons? What is the meaning of security in the 21st century? And how do we elevate other countries, countries that have rejected nuclear weapons, to come to the table and tell us what their aspirations are? These are the questions for us that are really important today. This academic initiative, however, also aspires to build on other forces that are now actually really taking shape in the 21st century. While nuclear weapons have now come back, we are now also facing new existential risks, climate change being one. And you see great social mobilization, great activism, especially among the young generation, towards new ideals for peace, environment, sustainability. So how do we make sure that our efforts build also on those forces? Together with the climate change movement, there are other forces, like for example, forces of local governance, of cities, districts, regions around the world, mayors of peace, that have actually rejected the theory of nuclear deterrence and have tried to embrace a more active role to promote peace. So while, in a way, we are concerned about the crisis that we are facing, we should also consider that there are new factors and new elements that we can actually build on, that can help us actually achieve, finally, that project that we have left incomplete many years ago. Because there is fundamentally no other solution or exit strategy. We either succeed or we perish. In 1949, Albert Compton actually wrote, 
we now have before us the clear choice between adjusting the pattern of our society on a world basis so that wars cannot come again or of following the outworn tradition of national self-defense, which, if carried through to its logical conclusion, must result in catastrophic conflict. There is no alternative. We either get this peace project right or there will be none. So let me finish today by thanking again you, Governor, the city of Hiroshima for standing again as an incredible example and, and symbol of what it could be, the project of global peace. And I'm proud to say Harvard University is absolutely thrilled to have this possibility to contribute to these global discussions and this global peace project by bringing forth some of the best minds and the best thinkers that this generation can offer. So once again, thank you so much and I look forward to working with you also in the future. Thank you. I thank you very much for your speech. And then let me start with the session one. Uh, what is the uh, significance? What is rethinking nuclear deterrence? Why now? We have um, Dr. Nishi, Michiru Nishida from uh, Nagasaki University as moderator. And from Harvard University, MacArthur Foundation Beyond Nuclear Deterrence Working Group, a co-chair, as well as a senior lecturer uh, at the King's uh, College London, we have Dr. Hassan Ebathni as presenter, and as discussant, we have Dr. Matthew Harris, a director, Royal United Services Institute for the Defense and uh, Security Studies, and Dr. Uh, Tanvi Kulkarni, Policy Fellow uh, at the Asia Pacific Leadership Network for Nuclear Non Preparation and Disarmament, and Ms. Anatia Akstigmatora, Program Officer at the Nuclear Threat Initiative. After the session, uh, during the coffee break, we will receive the questions uh, uh, online. For those uh, on site, you will find a QR code for questions at the back of the questionnaire sheet, which was distributed at entrance. And for online participants, please use the URL, which is uh, written at the column, the comment column. Uh, please specify to which speaker you would like to address your question to, if any, if you have problem in accessing those line, please. Uh, uh, come to the Secretariat now, uh, Dr. Nishida. Uh, my name is Nishida from uh, Nagasaki University. Uh, and uh, on this occasion of the working group's meeting in Hiroshima, including the experts uh, of uh, other uh, affiliation, we would like to start the session. Uh, I myself feel that nuclear weapons are uh, in humanitarian uh, weapons, and I would like to see the abolishment. And then we will no longer have to rely on nuclear deterrence. But uh, actually, at present, there are many nuclear weapons. Uh, so there are uh, actually neighboring countries which are exposed to the threat of nuclear weapons. So we can't really deny uh, that. Uh, the present situation. Amid this situation, what do we mean by rethinking nuclear deterrence at present? If there are no conflicts, uh, no wars, and every people are friendly, uh, maybe we can abolish nuclear weapons. But in this situation, there'll be no need for nuclear deterrence. But uh, in such a world, um, we can see such a world is realistic. So, given the current situation, um, how we have to really uh, rethink nuclear deterrence. Uh, so, uh, there are lots of questions associated with this preposition. But anyway, uh, we have uh, representatives, uh, experts from all over the world working on this issue. So. Uh, we expect all of them will give us very 
insightful presentation. Uh, if uh, there's any uh, solid idea that we no longer need nuclear deterrence, that would be quite interesting. Uh, Hiroshima Prefecture and Harvard University are working on the uh, very ambitious and the fundamental issues, and uh, both uh, uh, two sponsors are working very hard toward this uh, issue. Then can I invite the first Dr. Hassan Ebertini, uh, what the uh, working group is doing uh, and others for 20 minutes. Then after that, uh, we will invite the discussant. Now over to Dr. Hassan Elbertini. Sir Yuzaki, Governor of Hiroshima Prefecture. Um, ladies um, and gentlemen, distinguished guests today, um, colleagues, um, scholars from our working group, um, and members of the Japanese uh, public joining us today. I just want to, uh, at the outset, say I am personally very honored uh, to be here uh, today, um, to have this opportunity to come and talk to you um, about the work that we're doing on thinking beyond nuclear uh, deterrence. Let me, at the outset, um, say that I am here speaking to you on behalf um, of the group uh, that we've assembled together and specifically the three um, co-chairs that alongside me are running the group and I want to acknowledge them, Dr. Rebecca David uh, Gibbons um, and Dr. Stephen uh, Herzog um, and also members of the uh, our working group um, that um, are joining us uh, today and available um, in this hall. Um, this is our first conference and workshop with many more activity, activities to come. Um, and one cannot really think of a better place um, to hold our first workshop than Hiroshima, the first place that saw firsthand the impact of the use of nuclear uh, weapons. We were very much reminded of that today, visiting the museum and the Peace Memorial. Um, I'm going to address to you um, today four key uh, questions that I think is important to share with you as to the approach that we're taking in rethinking nuclear deterrence. So I will start by um, asking, like, why do we focus on nuclear deterrence? I'll then move on uh, to address why do we need to re-examine nuclear deterrence? How should we do it? And finally, what we have been doing in our working group and planning to do in the future. So why focus on nuclear deterrence? I mean, we're interested in nuclear weapons and the role that they play in international politics. Why specifically focus on nuclear deterrence? And the answer to this is because nuclear deterrence represents a key gateway into engaging with ideas about the utility and value of nuclear uh, weapons and views about the role in international politics. You can think of nuclear deterrence as the conceptual foundations for the material existence of nuclear weapons or the way we, uh, the collective humanity, we make sense or understand of the existence of nuclear weapons. Nuclear deterrence has historically come to present the dominant status quo idea about the role of nuclear weapons. Although frequently contested, and we need to acknowledge that, it represents the mainstream position on the value and mission of nuclear weapons. It's widely adopted by almost all nuclear um, weapon states and the majority of officials working in nuclear establishments um, in those countries. But what is deterrence and what is nuclear deterrence? I mean, some of what I'm going to share with you very briefly now might be very familiar to scholars um, in this field, but since we're joined by also members of the public that hear the word deterrence a lot, I thought it would be good also to explain what that is. Um, so deterrence is used in various contexts, um, including in the criminal justice system, for example, in parenting sometimes. Um, it comes from the act to deter, and basically it is the use of threats to prevent action. 
So nuclear deterrence here specifically, a nuclear variant of deterrence, is about influencing the behavior of an opponent so that they won't act by threatening nuclear violence. Of course, the catch here is that it entails issuing credible threats of nuclear violence. The uniqueness of nuclear deterrence comes from the uniqueness of nuclear violence that can be inflicted by nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons distinguish themselves from every type of weapon technology that came before them by both their power and the far-reaching and long-lasting consequences of their use, which can be measured on a global scale. Why do we need to examine or re-examine, and one needs to be humble here and acknowledge all previous efforts that have been done to examine nuclear deterrence, but why do we need to re-examine nuclear deterrence now? The key tenets of nuclear deterrence were developed within the context of the bipolar Cold War, and particularly the period straight after the use of nuclear weapons in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the end of World War II. It's a concept like any other concept that is and was embedded in a specific historical context. This specific context is the ideological, military, and economic rivalry between the US and the Soviet Union, and with them other states circling in their orbit or allied to them. We now obviously live in a different world with many more players bound together by complex economic and technological interdependencies. And that presents a different context to the context, initial context where nuclear deterrence emerged. There is obviously also the issue of technological change. Not only uh, are nuclear weapons becoming more destructive and agile, uh, we're also operating in a very different environment right now where advances in cyber connectivity, artificial intelligence, speeds, maneuverability and detection, all these um, have significant impact on um, the way we can approach nuclear weapons and pose new and different risks that we need to understand and perhaps invite us to rethink nuclear deterrence. You know, all these factors, connectivity, intelligence, speed maneuverability, detection, don't have a uniform um, effect um, uh, on nuclear politics or nuclear balances, um, but can allow, um, for example, um, effective, more precise counterforce strikes, or can undermine nuclear command and control and communication among others. And all these needs to be re, you know, reweaved into the thinking about deterrence and its suitability. Um, all these factors also highlight the entanglement between nuclear and non-nuclear military cap capabilities that can contribute to higher risk of inadvertent um, escalations. In other words, the world changes around us and we need to rethink nuclear politics and at the core of this also interrogate the concept of deterrence. We also need to rethink nuclear deterrence because there has been massive investments in nuclear modernization programs by almost all nuclear weapon states, and that is to replace, upgrade, and improve the nuclear arsenals. These modernization programs cost billions of dollars and run over an extended period of time. They are meant to enhance, improve arsenals, but with the cost and duration reflect a significant commitment for the continuation and, and entrenchment of a nuclear future that continues to rely on nuclear deterrence as a rationale. We're also seeing global nuclear order under strain and diplomatically deadlocked due to competing preferences, including between nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. We see that in the context of nuclear non-proliferation treaty where, um, uh, where agreement um, between states has become increasingly difficult. We see that reflected in the desperation by some states, particularly on the progress of nuclear disarmament promised under the NPT that led to efforts to craft a new treaty altogether prohibiting nuclear weapons for all states, a treaty that is championed 
strongly by many states and strongly also opposed by nuclear powers. There are many more reasons why we might need to re-examine nuclear deterrence that is weaved into all these different changes and trends happening around us. But it's also important to highlight a more recent factor, and that is the explicit nuclear threats in the context of the war um, against Ukraine. And for the first time in a long, um, in a long period, um, a war of aggression against a sovereign member of the United Nations that has security guarantees against its invasion is conducted and enabled under the shadow of nuclear threats. We see here, instead of uh, serving as a lost resort defense weapon against the existential threat of nuclear use by others, Russia is using the threat of nuclear attack as an offensive tactic to enable its unjust aggression against a non-nuclear weapon state and to deter NATO engagement. This further highlights the fragility of our global nuclear order and the dangerous potential for nuclear um, escalation. So, if we believe that nuclear deterrence requires reassessment, how do we go about doing it? And here I want to share with you some of the thoughts that sort of inform in a broader uh, sense our efforts in our working group. And I would start by saying um, we do this reassessment through emphasizing the importance of critical and rigorous engagement with our nuclear condition and particularly wider experiences of that nuclear condition. Let me emphasize how we can do that um, engagement. I think it's important that this engagement elucidates and challenges our assumptions, some of which can be hidden, and furthers our understanding of that nuclear condition and how it can be altered and the potential for change. It f should focus on conceptual innovation. Our language is never neutral, and it doesn't just dispassionately reflect the world, but also create and sometimes also justify it. We seek to engage with new concepts and analytical categories that capture a wider variety of experiences of the nuclear age, and that moves away from the sometimes sanitized language of nuclear strategy. Concepts such as vulnerability, survival, ordering, among others. I think it's important that we um, be methodologically curious and open to a range uh, of methods, from historical to social science case studies to quantitative surveys and statistical analysis and public opinion surveys. We need to develop new empirical insights through expanding our repertoire of context-rich case studies that expands our understanding of the diverse experiences of the nuclear age. Um, and as part of that, it is really important to emphasize the truly, uh, the need for global and diverse voices in nuclear scholarship and academic literature. So the study of nuclear politics has been dominated by the experience of great powers with little insight from regional politics, domestic politics beyond elite or bureaucratic politics, non-weapon states, non-nuclear weapon states. So the nuclear subaltern, if you can call it that, needs to be grasped and provided space to speak. We also need to acknowledge how embedded nuclear deterrence is um, in evolving notions of global security. And by global security here, we see uh, transformations through dynamics linked to global networks, transnational solidarity, um, that needs to be incorporated into our thinking about deterrence. We need to also think about how, how all that intersects with other important topics like climate change and the imperative for action it entails, and linked to the to it the imperative for action um, that would necessarily uh, entail collective and transformative action, and dare I say even revolutionary action. Um, no research is morally or ethically neutral, not least scholarship uh, on nuclear 
uh, weapons or weapons with the destructive capacity of nuclear weapons even. So our work needs to engage questions of agency, tracing the capability for action, but also fostering moral and ethical responsibility in the nuclear choices our research enables. Um, I think we should also follow a broader conceptions of policy relevance. And this um, entails engaging with public, um, the public, non-state actors, civil society, international organizations, not just thinking about influencing government officials, although they are also obviously import important. Um, we also need to emphasize the importance of adding new academic and scholarly research. So we're thinking about primarily here academic output and producing material that will end up on reading lists and syllabi of academic courses that currently occupy very little in terms of questioning and challenging nuclear deterrence. So how we're doing um, this in our working group. So um, what I shared with you just now is sort of like broader themes of how we can engage with, re-examine nuclear deterrence, how we're actually doing it. So I'm going to share briefly with you what we've done so far. So um, as my colleague Francesca has mentioned, we're part of a bigger network uh, funded by the MacArthur Foundation, and I also need to acknowledge their generous uh, funding. Uh, on rethinking nuclear deterrence. Our group specifically seeks to uh, explore ways through which we can move beyond nuclear deterrence. Um, we issued a call for proposals because we wanted to reach out to as many new voices as possible. We were actually very pleasantly surprised to receive a very high number of proposals from around the world and that exceeded um, our expectations. We formed a group of 34 academics, researchers from 18 different countries, um, covering almost all time zones, which creates very difficult challenges in terms of uh, meeting, even if online. We decided to focus on developing new academic um, research and outputs, uh, but also in terms of tangible out outputs, but also focus on nurturing a network, making new connections, providing a platform where things are discussed and allowed to organically grow among this or between members of this distinguished group and a very diverse group of scholars. So we have monthly meetings, inviting speakers, uh, followed by sometimes discuss discussions that are sometimes heated, but almost uh, very uh, useful. Um, and through the focus on generating discussion, engaging with the everyday, focusing on developing academic outputs, we're hoping that we um, that this approach triggers new insight by a group of new and emerging voices in the field of nuclear studies and you know, infuse that field with more fresh thinking that is much needed in order to rethink different options beyond nuclear deterrence. I think that brings me to the end of my notes. Um, as I conclude, I would like to thank you very much for your time um, and attention and pass back to the chair. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, Dr. Hassan El Bartimi. I forgot to introduce him to you. Um, he is a, a senior lecturer at King's College, and he is also a member of this working group. Thank you for this insightful presentation about uh, the activities of this working group and uh, many more approaches that we could take. Next, uh, I will invite Dr. Matthew Harris um, in London. Uh, he is from RUSI. It is the Royal United Services Institute for Defense and Security Studies. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, let me start uh, by thanking um, Governor Yozaki, uh, the Hiroshima Organization for Global Peace, and the Harvard Belfer Center, um, and the Network on Rethinking uh, Nuclear Deterrence. Um, and thank you, Francesca, for uh, 
hosting this uh, important event um, and for having me here in uh, Hiroshima. It's a real honor to be here and, and thank you to uh, everyone um, for coming, uh, coming today. Um, I have uh, an easy job in this session because I am just invited to criticize what my friend Hassan has said. And then in the second session, unfortunately, I have to give my own ideas uh, about how to achieve uh, nuclear disarmament, and then you all can criticize me. So let me enjoy this uh, while it lasts. Um, I, uh, firstly, I, I think uh, to say I would like to say some positive uh, words about the approach uh, that the rethinking uh, nuclear deterrence network uh, is taking. Uh, firstly, uh, the diversity of the participants it involves, and uh, the uh, freshness of the perspectives that are being applied to this subject uh, is crucial. Um, I. Studied, uh, started studying nuclear weapons issues um, at a time when um, the type of people that were interested in those issues and were speaking and writing about those issues was extremely um, uh, uh, homogenous, extremely undiverse. Um, and the profile of nuclear issues uh, globally uh, was much lower, public interest was much lower, um, and uh, in some respects it's positive that uh, the profile of these issues has increased. In other respects, unfortunately, it's negative because it's a result of increasing threats. But I think the approach of applying new perspectives and diverse perspectives to this topic is very important. I also think it's important to apply the, the creative creativity of methods, the new methods that uh, this network takes, which I think is very useful. I also think it's important to challenge um, and continually challenge existing concepts um, that uh, may be taken for granted. Okay, enough, enough nice stuff. Uh, now I will try to be uh, difficult uh, for a little bit. Let me raise um, four, four issues um, that I think it's important for uh, us all to, to wrestle with. Uh, the first issue I would like to raise is about uh, non-proliferation, about stopping the spread of nuclear weapons. And it's just to say um, that I think it's easy to forget how unusual it is for countries to um, give up the right to develop their own nuclear weapons and how difficult it has been to persuade countries to do that. The list of countries that had over time that has had the, both the technical opportunity to develop nuclear weapons and facing a threat from a nuclear neighbor or a nuclear enemy, um, those countries uh, have nearly all either developed nuclear weapons themselves or been persuaded to not to develop nuclear weapons because of extended nuclear deterrence, because of a guarantee of nuclear protection um, from uh, uh, the United States. Um, and this includes Japan, which is a country under the nuclear umbrella. And so I think sitting here in Hiroshima, in Japan, understanding the complexity and the difficulty of giving up um, nuclear weapons, the, 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 the right, uh, if right is the correct word, the, the, op the option of developing nuclear weapons. I think we need to recognize the, the, the size of the challenge of persuading countries to do that. Because we saw just, uh, just this week, for example, uh, South Korea, is receiving strengthened guarantees from the United States of nuclear protection. And I think we have to take a, a starting point that what we're aiming for is a huge task um, and, and we shouldn't underestimate it. Secondly, um, 
I think a value, uh, a, a great strength of this network and this thinking is that it um, aims to challenge the idea of nuclear deterrence. But it's also a weakness or a potential weakness if we make the mistake of thinking that deterrence is only an idea or only a concept that is invented. I can only speak for myself, but I think nuclear weapons are terrifying. And I think that most of my friends, most people I speak to think nuclear weapons are terrifying. And that terrifying effect works to some extent. There is such a thing as deterrence. There is such a thing as nuclear deterrence. It works. It might work badly. It might have severe risks. But there's a reason why states cling to this um, mechanism for their security. And it's because the terrifying power of nuclear weapons is real. And so I think we should keep in mind that while we, and especially as academics, while we try to cri cri criticize ideas and unpick ideas, they're not only ideas, there is something real there. Uh, thirdly, I think Hassan rightly talked um, about the war, and, and, and Francesca did as well, about the war in Ukraine, which is very high on uh, European minds um, and, and the minds of, of many people around the world. I think the situation in Ukraine should remind us to be humble in um, how we talk about the costs of war and how we approach those who facing conventional war look for nuclear guarantees. There are people in Ukraine who think, rightly or wrongly, and historically accurate or not historically accurate. But there are people who think that if Ukraine continued to possess the nuclear weapons that it had on its territory at the end of the Cold War, that it would not be facing uh, the situation it does today. And it's very different, the situation is very different f for me sitting in a comfortable office in London or Berlin um, at peace than it is for someone facing the horror of conventional war. And so there is a, we have to have a certain humility in how we, um, how we uh, challenge the ideas of those who think that nuclear weapons will prevent that horror. And then lastly, I think it's impossible to be in Hiroshima and not think very hard about what the world would look like if nuclear weapons were used again. And we do not know what the day after uh, nuclear weapons use would look like today. It could be that um, global condemnation of the country that used that weapon was so strong and the consequences were so severe that um, countries, countries realize that nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence uh, are self-defeating. Or a country could be facing uh, conventional invasion, a conventional war. It uses nuclear weapons. The war ends in a way that that country thinks suits its interests. And then other states might think, okay, this tool does work. We can use it to protect our interests. And so I think the need to confront uh, the world as it is, the need to ask those difficult questions that Francesca uh, mentioned in, in her opening remarks is really important. Um, I applaud uh, this network for grappling uh, with them. And the very last thing I want to say is that we were asked in the um, instruction for this session uh, what can citizens do uh, in this area? And for me, the most important thing is to be interested in this issue, to read and think about it, and then not be afraid to challenge those uh, who are sitting on podiums with a microphone 
talking about them, um, to ask difficult questions of these ideas, to ask for evidence for, for what they're saying, and for push to push for, for, for what, what, what they think is, is right. So I look forward to a really interesting discussion today um, and to everyone's uh, difficult questions uh, and, and the answers that we can give. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Matthew. In particular, uh, new nuclear weapons are terrifying, so that's why nuclear deterrent uh, people think may work. Uh, and uh, and there is a um, in humanitarian aspect in nuclear weapons. They agree uh, that. Uh, uh, this uh, thought, how could we relate that thought to the nuclear weapons? Uh, uh, there is some sort of element, uh, the um, dilemma. Then I would like to invite Dr. Tambi Kurkarani from APLN. Uh, and those people are not really members of the Harvard Working Group. And now over to you, Tambi. Thank you. Um, let me start by saying thank you to the Hiroshima Prefecture, um, the Hiroshima uh, Organization for Global Peace, and Belfast Center at Harvard University for having me here today to speak on rethinking nuclear deterrence. Um, I'm truly honored to be in this historic city of Hiroshima for this important event. Let me start by echoing what Hassan said, that nuclear deterrence has been the single most powerful discourse for the possession, preservation, and the proliferation of nuclear weapons in the world. The logic of nuclear deterrence guides most nuclear weapons programs around the world, be it doctrines or policies, or even logistics and infrastructure around nuclear weapons. And we're still grappling with the contradiction that while the nuclear weapon is not supposed to be available to all states in the international system, nuclear deterrence as a logic is supposed, is supposed to be widely accepted behind the possession of these weapons by a handful of states. Now, over decades since um, the doctrine of nuclear deterrence developed, um, the belief in nuclear deterrence, I think, has been um, reinforced, not only because um, of the military and political power that these weapons confer, but also because nuclear deterrence theory um, over the years has braved and um, endured many intellectual attacks on it. So having said that, um, nuclear deterrence theory we know, like Hassan said, evolved and developed in the US um, through intense theoretical debates in the context of the Cold War. And a number of related concepts uh, emerged in relation to, these, um, or to this uh, theory. Um, these theoretical debates in the US had several points of divergences, but certain fundamental principles of deterrence got consolidated. For instance, the assumption of rationality of decision makers um, is one, or its applicability to uh, major conflicts. Uh, or for that matter, concepts of retaliatory threat um, and unacceptable damage. Uh, the notion of credibility of deterrence was also an assumption. And an imperative for constant technological innovations uh, for deterrence stability and strategic stability. Now, each of these fundamental principles were contested during the Cold War, but also in the post-Cold War period, uh, bringing out certain inherent and important, important dis deficiencies with nuclear deterrence thinking. Uh, for instance, the problem with the rationality assumption, right, um, and the disjuncture between expectations and behaviors, um, the emergence of new nuclear actors uh, and a complex matrix of nuclear relationships that goes beyond simple diets, um, which involves complex security trilemmas, as you have them in the Asia-Pacific, um, and also the emergence of uh, what is now known as a nuclear chain, which is composed of many diets. Uh, the problem of asymmetric capabilities and to deal with what is called as asymmetric deterrence um, like Hassan said, the interplay of nuclear capabilities with conventional, cyber, space-based capabilities, which leads to what is called as entanglements, the illusion of credibility, but at the same time, the unending pursuit for it, and of course, the 
emergence of weapon systems and technologies that are meant for nuclear war fighting and not necessarily nuclear deterrence. So a number of deficiencies have already been discussed. We can discuss uh, these which call for a rethinking of nuclear deterrence. But the ones that um, concerns the work I do, uh, specifically in the context of the Asia Pacific and Southern Asia, would be that would be the problem of contextualizing nuclear deterrence to non-Western conflicts, such as the South Asian conflict involving India and Pakistan. And nuclear deterrence as a hegemonic intellectual discourse in which non-Western experiences and perspectives have essentially been missing in its formulation, such that the West's experience with nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence is assumed to be a global experience. So in the context of South Asia, now there has been an unquestioned application of the nuclear deterrence thinking um, as far as the nuclear weapons of India and Pakistan are concerned. In the aftermath of the 1998 nuclear test, which is exactly 25 years um, since today, since uh, this year, scholars all over the world scuttled to explain um, how the deterrence game would be played in South Asia. Um, Debates about deterrence stability and the stability-instability paradox became very popular. And the multiple crises between India and Pakistan gave ample fodder to nourish these debates. But over the years, scholars from the region and from outside um, have said that nuclear deterrence is actually inadequate to understand the nuclear behaviors of countries like India and Pakistan, and to also understand their nuclear relations and their nuclear policies. Scholars have argued that there is not only a need to re-examine the application of and the assumptions of nuclear deterrence uh, doctrine, but also to question its vocabulary um, as far as the region is concerned. Uh, for instance, geographical proximity, domestic factors, cross-border cultural linkages, a historically constructed image of the other. Asymmetries in not just nuclear capabilities, but also conventional and economic capabilities are all factors that affect the nuclear behaviors and the nuclear policy making in South Asia. Both countries have been trying to find a middle ground between doing too much uh, by launching a massive nuclear attack on the other and doing too little by submitting to the other side's nuclear threats. And this is their credibility problem. Unfortunately, when seen through the, the lens of a neat and calculable deterrence theory, um, most scholars in the West have concluded that South Asia is a recipe for nuclear disaster and a recipe for nuclear deterrence breakdown. So what I'm saying is that while we rethink nuclear deterrence um, in the context of changing strategic considerations and global circumstances, it should also be about contextualizing nuclear deterrence to the experiences domestic politics, historically developed patterns of conflict and enmity, um, the relative economic and technological resources of actors who possess them, as well as actors who are subjected to the threat of nuclear uh, deterrence. I think I'll, I'll stop here and present my ideas about how to think nuclear deterrence in the next session. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tembi, from the South Asian perspective. Uh, the nuclear deterrence basically evolved in the Western uh, world, should be uh, rethought and re examined whether that concept is applicable to South Asian context or not. Where is it explained? Uh, so next speaker is from NTI, the Nuclear Threat Initiative. And uh, we are going to invite um, Analia Agustin Walhota. Thank you, Governor Yazaki, uh, Hiroshima Prefecture, Hiroshima Organization for Global Peace, and the Belfer Center um, for this important event and for having me here. It's an, such a privilege and very humbling to be here with you all in the city of Hiroshima. Um, I also want to note that the remarks I'm making today are in the context of a project co-founded by NTI called Horizon 2045, which, 
uh, focuses on many of the themes laid out by Hassan in his presentation and how we might build new paradigms for security in our changing world today. Um, and I'll explain a bit more of that in, in the second session today. So I'd like to pick up on some of the uh, questions that Matthew raised about the current context in Ukraine and the current security environment more broadly and why this requires us to rethink nuclear deterrence. I think the war in Ukraine shows and demonstrates the real risks of basing our international security on deterrence as we see tensions worsening amongst nuclear armed states and arms control agreements unraveling. We are seeing almost all of the guardrails around nuclear weapons dissolving, which is making us increasingly unsafe. But I think, um, you know, some of the ideas which Matthew raised in, in the ways in which Putin's nuclear threats might confound or challenge many of our assumptions about nuclear deterrence. Um, I, I think, however, that we should remember that his threats are not a bug in the international system based on nuclear deterrence. They're part of the practice itself of nuclear deterrence, which is based on credibly threatening the use of nuclear weapons, and as a result, places the power to inflict lasting global devastation in the hands of a few fallible individuals. So, while the war in Ukraine might raise questions for how this plays out, we should not forget that this global devastation is built into the very logic and practice of deterrence. It's not a sanitized theory. It has these material realities baked into its, its credible threat. And fundamentally, this war is putting nuclear deterrence and our trust that it won't fail to the test. What we know is that the empirical impacts of nuclear weapons are based on facts, and this is nowhere more evident than in visiting the Hiroshima Memorial uh, Museum. It's the belief that nuclear deterrence as a theory and as a doctrine uh, uh, that will not fail, which cannot be proven. And this, I think, is is important to underscore all of our ideas, is that nuclear deterrence, um, as some of my panelists raise, is not just a theory, and it is, it is indeed one that is, must be historically contextualized, but it also has material realities that are neglected in many of the policy discussions. And it's a very, very risky and dangerous bet to continue to think that nuclear deterrence will not fail, especially given the multiple dynamics that are shifting the threat environment in rapid and, un and often unpredictable ways. I also um, want to echo Professor Giovannini and Professor Albatini and the working group in their focus on thinking of a broader definition of international security. In fact, I think this is already beginning to happen within communities in the public who are experiencing threats to their security from climate change, the COVID-19 pandemic, and cyber threats. And I think it's absolutely crucial that we be exploring how the growing evidence of climate change and attention to environmental issues will intersect with norms about nuclear weapons. This is also crucial for getting more publics to understand and be more familiar with the practice of nuclear deterrence, as it's, it's sadly understood more and more by the general public, and especially by young people, as sort of a problem of yesteryear and something that we can't do anything about. And so it seems really critical at this moment that we begin to consider different pathways for thinking about security that are not themselves grounded in nuclear deterrence, but instead are grounded in addressing our shared challenges and global threats, including pandemics and climate change. And this will be difficult for many, many reasons, not the least that uh, governments are, the way they are currently, are not set up to address these in a way that is conducing, conducive to managing such intersectionality. And we also have resource limitations. Often we are prioritizing in our governments uh, near-term priorities, but as we've seen in recent years, this is a, a pattern that we cannot afford to continue to replicate for so long. I also um, want to make an another sort of broader comment that some of my panelists raised is that the current security environment can make conversations about um, rethinking nuclear deterrence seem, uh, although m more urgent than ever before, but perhaps unrealistic or tone deaf to the moment. Unfortunately, we've seen, as, um, as Governor Yazaki mentioned at the outset, a hardening and a doubling down on stances and beliefs in the effectiveness of nuclear deterrence. Um, but in this state of heightened risks, it's crucial that states take any steps that they can 
to promote dialogue, risk reduction, and de-escalation. And this is, these we, steps we know are not a substitute for nuclear disarmament, but are a critical first step in the direction. And I think the working group offers an important opportunity to be able to link some of these longer term questions, foundational questions for rethinking nuclear deterrence, to near term practical risk reduction measures. Um, finally, I want to conclude with a few remarks on the, the idea of, of what citizens can do to rethink nuclear deterrence, especially being here in Hiroshima. I think from where I sit in the United States, there's unfortunately been a significant decline in the historical memory of the horrors of nuclear weapons, which were inflicted among, on, on the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And younger people who are now 80 years removed from the detonations need to have the tools and the resources to learn about the realities of nuclear weapons' impacts on people and the environment, and to learn about the continuous harms that, they are, that are inflicted by our reliance on nuclear weapons from testing, development, to storage, I mean, uh, to waste. Um, this requires an intergenerational conversation and a global one, as my panelists have pointed out, and I think was, was laid out very well by the conversation so far. It also requires more civic discourse and education and storytelling around nuclear weapons to broaden in the aperture. And events like this one are very important so that the general public is able to interact with academics, non-governmental organizations, and, and policymakers. It also means meeting people where they are. In the US, this is a problem, especially for younger people uh, who feel they have no connection to nuclear policy and the decisions that are being made. Um, and this is very fair, given that there is uh, you know, a, a architecture of bureaucracy and secrecy that sort of shrouds nuclear policy uh, in many nuclear weapon states. So I think we need to find ways to build connections uh, from between nuclear weapons and other issues, especially by exploring the relationship of nuclear weapons to issues that people already care about, everyday people already care about, younger people already care about. And it's important, and as this working group shows so well, to find diverse storytellers and, and spokespeople from different reaches of the world that are not just in the nuclear weapon states, who are often the center of this conversation, who can connect with different audiences and share accessible information and stories and, and broaden the conversation. I think importantly also though, publics need to have a sense of agency and that there's something they can do about all this. Um, because as we can see, this is an extremely powerful discourse and uh, this is daunting to even begin to consider, to reconsider. So I think it's important that we, in all of our frameworks, treat nuclear weapons as a human-made problem that is solvable and give people a, a kind of an alternative vision for the future that does not rely on nuclear weapons. This is absolutely crucial, I think, when something has been conditioned and is embedded in our entire international security context and, as uh, mentioned by some of my co-panelists, uh, global order more broadly, as we see with NATO and emerging risks in... Um, here in the Asia Pacific, it's very important that we build a kind of image of what might be possible. And to, to envision this future, we need to first unshackle our thinking from nuclear deterrence. Uh, campaigns like the one put on by HOPE uh, on the anniversary of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki's bombings, um, Cranes for Our Future, which NTI is proud to collaborate with them, is an important, I think, example of how broader public awareness uh, can be bolstered to ensure that these horrors were never, are never forgotten. Um, lastly, since this is uh, you know, a G7 related event, I think it's good to note that I think this is the first time in history that all the leaders of the G7 do not have Hiroshima and Nagasaki in their living memory. So I think it's all the more important that they are meeting with Hibakusha here in Hiroshima uh, so that their policy discussions are informed by the realities of nuclear weapons. So I think I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your talk. So she said that um, nuclear weapons is an um, actually a problem that is caused by human being. Therefore, we are able to resolve this issue. So thank you very much. Well, time has come already, but um, we are allowed to extend our discussion by five minutes. 
I wanted to uh, go the second round, but we have only five minutes left for this first session. So first to Hassan. Um, the, after listening to the discussion, I have a question. Well, uh, there are many perspectives. One common thread is uh, the environment has changed between when nuclear deterrence was established as uh, the theory and now. And by taking a lot of perspectives, uh, we needed to think about nuclear deterrence. That was a point that was made. And uh, now in this environment, we needed to have uh, the opportunity to review and rethink the nuclear deterrence. And is it leading us to decline or dismiss the idea of a nuclear deterrence altogether? Or are we going to adapt uh, to the current environment when we have a discussion on nuclear deterrence? It is just about it. Uh, do you have any thought about these the way we are going forward. And also, um, if we dismiss nuclear deterrence altogether, well, in the nuclear deterrence, in the conventional framework of security, it has a role, uh, it had a role to play. And then what should we replace it? Uh, especially uh, the security decision makers, how are we going to talk about this? Um, for example, what is the replacement of the nuclear deterrence? We need to sh present something as a replacement. So just one minute for each or something. Um, well, this is a very uh, difficult question, but I hope that uh, you will respond to these questions. Great. Yeah, thank you so much for the panelists and for the chair for um, the remarks and very interesting points that... Um, that you've raised, <clears throat> uh, you mentioned of, I have one minute. <laughs> Is that true? Uh, yeah. <laughs> or, or we all have one minute. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think you, you have a more priority. So. <laughs> all right, so um, uh, very um, interesting points. I think I, I want at the outset to maybe also emphasize something that I've not mentioned in my, in my points somehow, which is, um, we're, we, as part of our group, our group is not only uh, people who want to necessarily challenge entirely nuclear deterrence. So in our examination, in our critical examination of nuclear deterrence, uh, we also welcome conversations with uh, scholars that feel committed, but just want to take committed to deterrence, nuclear deterrence, but we just want to take it seriously um, and think about it seriously through examining the assumptions, you know, and, and critically engaging, engaging with it, not from critically in the sense that it's criticizing it necessarily, would include that, uh, but, um, but, but basically taking it seriously. Um, so yeah, so in that sense, our group would have been even richer had the three panelists uh, been able to to, to join us, uh, including Matt um, as well. Um, I, I want to comment on something that Matt um, mentioned that I think is, um, you know, is is interesting and I think worth also commenting on is the idea that deterrence works. Nuclear deterrence works, so why bother changing it if it works? Um, and, uh, and and I think that is a very it's a for, it's a for, it's a formidable uh, you know challenge, but one that I think is very important in terms of like thinking beyond it. Um, and one of the challenges is is that we have intuitive sense that it would work because the cost is so high. The destructive potential is so huge, the cost is so high, so intuitively, we, it's easy to think it's, you know, that it would induce some caution in, in people, and a lot of caution even. But there are two elements that this does not um, address. First, uh, although we might have an intuitive sense that it works, it's actually quite difficult to know that it, if it actually does, because we're talking about if it works, it will lead to a non-event. So any tangible footprints of it working 
can be explained by all sorts of things. So establishing any causal links can be difficult. So empirically, you know, I think we need to be humble in terms of, you know, um, you know, cl claiming that it works. And I'm saying that conceding that intuitively, I think, you know, it's difficult to challenge that it would not induce a level of caution. So the, the, in response to this, I want to say that it does not cover everything and we are, have no guarantees that it work all the time. And I think these are two key critiques that anyone who's pro-continuation of nuclear deterrence would need to respond back to. So um, it might not work all the time because hey, we're human beings working in complex societies and you know, it is not guaranteed that it would work all the time. But baked into it, deterrence is meant to avoid you know, deliberate decision to use nuclear weapons, but what about mistakes, um, misperceptions, accidents, technical failures? These are not deterrable. Um, and the question, and, and you know, when they are not um, neutralized by nuclear deterrence, nuclear deterrence does not really um, address them. The challenge moving beyond nuclear deterrence is going to be difficult because the world that we're living in has been living with, the, with nuclear weapons now for a long period of time. It would require us accepting some new vulnerabilities uh, that we're not used to and no one I think it's naive to say is going to be um, easy. Uh, but I think personally it is very important to move beyond nuclear deterrence into a safer world. So when you mentioned, for example, extended deterrence, um, yeah, that is part of the infrastructure that we're living in and has been around for some time. And I think moving beyond that will necessarily entail difficult decisions about accepting new vulnerabilities. But at the same time, um, having actually real transformative change would entail us to think that something like extended deterrence sort of like conflates the medicine with the disease. I mean, it's, it's you know, you st you know you're, you're, it does n doing that does not really preclude any of the risks that I've just mentioned about, you know, things going wrong, and they can still do. Um, right, yeah, I want to leave the, the floor for the other panelists in case they've got something to add, but thank you. Uh, okay, we don't have time left. Uh, okay, uh, I would like to have a break of 10 minutes and uh, that will be followed by 15 minutes Q&As. So I would like to stop here for now. Thank you very much. Now a break time for 10 minutes. So please come back at 22 past. And the, the simple refreshment is available in the back of the room. So please help yourself. And now we take questions from you during the break, online questions. If you are in the venue, please use this QR code to send questions. Those online, uh, please use the URL on the message. And uh, please specify uh, to which uh, discussant or panelist your question is addressed at. If you need to leave this hall for today, and then please return your receiver at the reception. Thank you very much. See you soon. Okay, now, um, now we close the question, uh, and then we will continue Q&A of session one. In the interest of time, we may not be able to handle all the questions you kindly ex uh, offered. Now, Professor Nishida, please take it from here. Uh, already we have received a lot of questions. But, uh, well, uh, now we are behind the schedule, so the Q&A is only for 10 minutes. We need to finish this at 35 past. Okay, then I will summarize questions uh, and then some of them will maybe addressed to specific panelists and discussant, but on anybody who want to jump in, please. First of all, uh, 
the people around the world obtaining weapons. Uh, that, it, because that they are not able to trust the government and the national leaders, um, it is uh, the world it is full of distrust and mistrust. That is why we are not able to give up weapons. Do you think it is right or correct? This is the first question, and then think goes both ways. So the more we argue deterrence is key for survival, the more countries will want nukes. So uh, what do you think about it? Uh, this is anonymous on peace, having an interest and know more about peace is very important. But the, the hurdle at the beginning is very high. Uh, we needed to take action so that people will be interested in peace and nuclear issues. How can we do that? How can we encourage people to be interested in these matters, especially to young people? Uh, this is not directed at anybody, but the Anyana mentioned about the young generation. So I, I think um, you are a good person to respond to this question. Another question uh, to all of you. In the U.S., uh, there is no opportunity for young people to know about the danger of nuclear weapons. Uh, there is no education for that. Why? Because Hiroshima and Nagasaki are working very hard to let young people notice about the danger. Why it is not possible to do in the U.S.? So this may be also directed at Ananya, I guess. And uh, suppose that there will be no nuclear weapons on the Earth. But still, um, even if the abolition is achieved, but there is a technology out there already. And then if somebody intends to develop it once again, it is possible. So even if we can abolish for uh, once, but still some other countries in the future tries to develop it once again, and then this issue will continue forever. This is also a difficult and a deep question, so I hope that somebody can respond to this. And then my question minutes ago, well, uh, reviewing, uh, rethinking the nuclear deterrence, is it just adjusting to the current environment, it's updating it? Or uh, where can we find the replacement of nuclear deterrence? So these are the questions we got. So again, just one or two minutes for each. And for you, not you don't have to cover all of the questions, but you can choose and pick the questions you would like to address. Please start. Great, excellent. Thank you so much. A very interesting question and delighted to um, um, to know that you know our conversation triggered so much interest, and that is fantastic. It's part of what we are trying to do. Um, I'll perhaps start by the last question that was um, raised by Dr. Nishida um, about alternatives and um, how can we replace um, nuclear deterrence, and if the concept can be adapted for better or more efficient or more safe use. Um, I think opinions within the group might vary, so I'm going to share uh, my own perspective uh, on this. So I, I just want to say that I'm not now speaking on behalf of anyone, no, nor was I speaking on behalf of anyone earlier. Um, um, I think um, our task um, as thinking about scholars, uh, researchers, um, is not necessarily to come with an alternative. And I know others would agree, would, would agree some would agree, others would disagree uh, with me. I think from a personal perspective, I see the key uh, mission for us is to open space for possibility of something different. If you're working in this field, if you're studying these topics, there is a high degree of cynicism and feeling that any change uh, is not um, uh, possible or foreseeable. Um, I think the right approach for us as scholars is to say that is not true. 
to think about different ways through which change can be studied, understood, think about concepts that can reframe the problem, and ultimately to open up spaces for that change to happen, rather than coming up with a blueprint of what is the alternative. So I see our task, and that is again the personal me, is opening up space for alternatives to grow rather than presenting them. It's uh, obviously a, a multi-generational challenge. Um, and there is a, you know, uh, it's difficult to come up with a solution now that would provide a, a wholesale alternative, nor is it, I think, necessary, given where we are now. Right. Please. Thank you. Um, I will answer the question that was for me about whether uh, talking about nuclear deterrence encourages other countries to want nuclear deterrence. Uh, I agree and, I d and, and disagree. So, uh, I agree that um, it's very difficult to imagine a world existing forever where some countries put nuclear weapons at the center of their security and other countries are, are asked forever to live without them. Uh, this was understood very well when the non-proliferation treaty was negotiated. You can't ask countries to live forever without something that some states say is crucial to their security. But I think, um, I don't think it's true that the basic idea of nuclear deterrence is something that states have to learn from the nuclear weapon states. I think that's a little bit um, patronizing. Um, countries can understand for themselves very well that if they live next to a nuclear neighbor, they might want nuclear weapons for deterrence. The basic idea, I think, is not something that is uh, that encourages proliferation. But, um, uh, I think Tanvi made a very important point about deterrence in different contexts. And one thing that I think is concerning is if some of the um, concepts within nuclear deterrence are taken from one context and applied unthinkingly to another context. So uh, Cold War deterrence concepts like flexible response or limited nuclear capabilities, the idea of what tactical nuclear weapons are or versus strategic nuclear weapons. All these words and concepts had historical roots, mainly in one region of the world. They don't translate um, easily into other regions and into other cultural contexts. And I think it's a mistake to apply them. So the basic idea of nuclear deterrence, I think, is not something that is copied. It is something that states can imagine for themselves, but I do think there is a risk in um, some of the ideas being transferred from one context to another. Thank you. Uh, so no specific question pointed to me, so I will just take um, a few questions that um, Michi mentioned. Um, so the path to thinking about beyond nuclear deterrence is to rethink nuclear deterrence, is to question nuclear deterrence, is to um, point out the limitations of nuclear deterrence, but also the strengths uh, of nuclear deterrence and whether it works in one context and it doesn't work in another context. Um, it is about accounting for uh, what is new, accounting for what has changed, um, bringing in uh, new aspects, um, which is already being done, for instance, race, culture, are all different aspects that are bringing new perspective uh, to nuclear deterrence thinking. Um, and you're quite right, trust um, is a problem, but then we can also raise questions about whether trust or the lack of trust is the obstacle that um, keeps us from going uh, beyond deterrence or whether nuclear deterrence is the obstacle that keeps us from moving towards trust.
trust and confidence. So these are sort of the questions that need to be dealt with if we are going to talk about uh, beyond uh, nuclear deterrence. Nuclear deterrence and nuclear myth-making um, are very close to each other. Um, and so um, along with questioning nuclear deterrence, I agree that um, there is a need to uh, invest in busting nuclear myths um, if we have to question nuclear deterrence. Um, and finally, um, we have to remember that nuclear deterrence or the concepts such as mutual nuclear deterrence are about managing relationships. They're not about resolving conflicts. And what we need in certain parts of the world is conflict resolution. And that is not what nuclear deterrence is going to do. Um, I think I'll leave the rest of the questions to Ananya. Thank you for those questions about engaging young people. Uh, I think four main points come to mind um, about, you know, peace is a big hurdle. How do we bring young people to the conversation and what's possible or not possible in the U.S.? So first, I think, uh, to the working group's credit, and as, as Hassan uh, pointed out in his presentation, education is very important. And so the fact that these new paradigms are being formed at a working group like this that will make it onto syllabi and that give new frameworks that say that nuclear deterrence is not the inevitable future forever and ever, amen. Uh, this is very important because the next generation of policymakers and citizens, global citizens, will be educated in a different kind of framework where more creativity is possible. It is uh, an uphill battle to try to convince people in power and policymakers at the present to change their minds. So a, a new paradigm for the next generation is absolutely crucial and it's a mistake to neglect it. Second, we need new frameworks in the actual policy realm and that is already being played out in an important way as we see with the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons or the TPNW. And so uh, last year in the first meeting of states parties which occurred, you saw a quite a novelty occur in international arena with nuclear policy, these high-level fora. The TPNW centered the voices of Hibakusha and survivors uh, and youth. And these kinds of normative changes are very powerful for inviting different kinds of people into the conversation. This is absolutely something that should continue. And I hope that it makes its way into other multilateral fora. Um, on this subject, thirdly, I think we need to meet people where they are, like I said. So the importance of nuclear policy not just being limited to doctrines, force structures, military strategies, but its intersections historically and empirically with other matters that are very important for young people today. Harms to the environment historically and in the present ongoing. Harms from testing uh, historically and ongoing. The detonations here in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. These must be at the forefront because young people really care about these. And if they had the tools and knowledge, they would be able to. But finally, I think it's not just about education, but about empowerment. And so young people need to be invited to tables such as this one. And this, as I mentioned in my, in my remarks earlier, there is an architecture of secrecy, bureaucracy, uh, and uh, several hurdles that are necessary to cross in order to make it into nuclear policy spaces in many nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states, but in the U.S. especially, there are many barriers to access. So overcoming these is very important and making a deliberate effort to do so at the foundational level because this issue will be carried on by the next generation. And if, if the current policymakers do not neglect that fact, we will, uh, as, as, uh, French, as uh, Professor Giovannini put it, we may perish rather than us seeking and, and obtaining peace. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much. Under the new environment, we really think that the nuclear deterrent uh, should be reviewed and rethought, and also opening up the space so that the new alternatives could be introduced. Uh, was also mentioned as it's a wonderful approach, and how to involve the uh, multi multiple stakeholders' views to broaden uh, the horizon of the thinking, education as a uh, and the new, uh, also in Fukushima uh, case, uh, 
there was a nuclear power myth, uh, there is a nuclear myth, so we have to bust the nuclear myth, uh, is very uh, important. Thank you very much, speakers and uh, discussants. Let me give them a big applause. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We are going to conclude the session one. And then we will move on to session two without break. So, so far we have discussed about the uh, rethinking of the nuclear tolerance. And uh, in session two, uh, we are going to ask our panelists to share with us uh, their uh, research project. And then uh, Professor Nishida will be continue to chair the session. And for this uh, uh, session two, we have invited uh, Laura Constein from Leeds University, and also we have invited uh, C. Uh, Morfo uh, Wallace from the University of the uh, uh, with uh, Water Strand. And also this discussion will be uh, joined uh, Matthew Harris, uh, Tanvi uh, Kalani, and uh, Ananya uh, Mahatola, who have already spoke to us. And we're going to take uh, questions. So those who have a question, please access the URL or please uh, read the uh, QR code and pose your questions. And if you have any specific person for whom you would like to address your question, please specify that. Now, uh, Professor Nishida, well, thank you very much. In session two, we're going to ask each speaker to share with us their research project. And for this, uh, we have invited uh, five panelists. First of all, uh, we are going to uh, invite uh, the uh, Lola Constein, Associate Professor of International Politics at Leeds University. And also, uh, she is a member of the Harvard University MacArthur Foundation Beyond Nuclear Tolerance Working Group, so please. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start by thanking Hiroshima Prefecture and the Hiroshima Organization for Global Peace for their kind invitation to take part in this event. I'm also grateful to the Harvard University MacArthur Foundation Beyond Nuclear Deterrence Working Group for bringing us all together here in Hiroshima. It's a great honor to speak with you all today. It is my first time in Hiroshima and deeply moving and humbling to be here. It's a place I have learned, thought, and spoken about for years. I'm very grateful for your hospitality in hosting me and the other working group members. Hontoni arigato gozaimasu. I will just take a few minutes to introduce myself and my research and how it speaks to the theme. I grew up in Ireland, which is a neutral, non-nuclear weapons state, and I never thought at all about nuclear weapons growing up. What I didn't know, and I think what most people, Irish people don't know, is that despite our small stature, Ireland has a long history of important political action on nuclear weapons. In fact, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is the core treaty of nuclear governance, was an Irish initiative. Ireland has recently once again been a leader in an international treaty on nuclear weapons as one of the key states driving the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. But I knew nothing about this and I thought little about nuclear weapons. I think most people today who do not live with the direct history of nuclear weapons like the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki are the same. They don't think too much about nuclear weapons outside of particular times of threat or crisis when nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence become visible for a brief moment. For example, after the nuclear threats that Russian President Putin made last year after the invasion of Ukraine, there was fear and debate where I live in the UK about the possibility of nuclear war. For a brief time, we could see and sense nuclear deterrence and nuclear violence. But over time, this fear again receded, and people continued with their everyday lives, and became again unable to see nuclear violence. We know that nuclear conflict is not only possible, it is at the core of defense doctrines of nine nuclear weapon states, but it is often too much to take on as real. Research has shown that publics care about nuclear weapons but feel powerless to engage with an issue framed in apocalyptic terms. Not only that, but the nuclear armed states want nuclear weapons to be seen as a secret and technical realm that is not the subject of public debate. And so nuclear deterrence becomes publicly invisible. It becomes a phantom. Our working group is called Beyond Nuclear Deterrence, but how do you move beyond a phantom? 
I am interested in how to make nuclear deterrence real by showing that it is an everyday event. Around the world, there are roughly 13,000 nuclear weapons stationed in the US, multiple countries in Europe, Russia, South and East Asia. This is nuclear deterrence, a massive, costly and dirty complex of weapons production, maintenance and deployment. This complex is located in specific places with impacts on local environments, economies and social fabrics. Local communities are embedded into the practice of nuclear deterrence as they are built around weapons plants or military bases that host nuclear bombers or near radar stations for ballistic missile defence. As such, nuclear weapons are deeply connected to other issues such as urban planning, environmental destruction and public health. So while the consequences of nuclear war would be calamitous, thinking nuclear politics only in terms of potential crisis limits our ability to see the everydayness of nuclear deterrence. Nuclear weapons have also been intertwined with long-standing processes of violent colonial extraction. The first weapons made were, were made from uranium mined by forced labour in the then called Belgian Congo. Nuclear states conducted over 2,000 nuclear tests worldwide, mostly on colonised or indigenous lands. Communities near testing and production sites have lived with trans transgenerational effects on their environment and health, including higher rates of cancers, miscarriages and infant mortality, food contamination and mass displacement. These are the everyday practices and consequences of nuclear deterrence. With all this in mind, my research aims to move beyond nuclear deterrence by making visible the extent of the machinery needed to produce deterrence. Rather than being an inevitable or self-perpetuating practice, nuclear deterrence requires vast resources and political will. I want to highlight the situated, everyday practices of nuclear deterrence and the extensive political and economic activities involved in maintaining a global nuclear weapons complex. One way I do this is by engaging with feminist approaches in my research. Feminism allows me to do two key things. Firstly, to question how gendered power hierarchies underpin many things that we might otherwise accept as common sense in international politics. Secondly, feminism allows me to see the gendered and marginalized bodies and sites that are a central part of the practice of nuclear deterrence to see the violence of nuclear weapons in the everyday, not in the abstract, and to see how this violence connects across the world and across time. My feminist approach can show the connections of different forms of nuclear violence. For example, the bombs dropped on this city and on Nagasaki were designed in the United States at the various laboratories and production plants that made up the Manhattan Project. The famous Los Alamos laboratory in which the atomic bomb was designed was located on land taken by the forced expulsion of Pueblo and native New Mexicans. This history of displacement in service of the bomb can also be seen during the tests of US thermonuclear weapons in the Marshall Islands in the Pacific or during Russian tests in Kazakhstan, both of whose peoples were also displaced in service of the bomb. This lens on nuclear deterrence connects the outcome of the catastrophic destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the legacy of the Hibakusha to the labor of hundreds of thousands of people, the extractive and often exploitative processes of mining, processing and enriching uranium and the lasting impacts of these processes on communities and places around the world. I hope that my research on the everyday practice of nuclear deterrence can help us to see nuclear deterrence not as a phantom, but as something that we continually choose to do in a million small ways, and therefore as something that we can contest and change. Domo arigato gozaimashite. Well, thank you very much, Laura. So he shared with us the, uh, her uh, feminism approach uh, and also the gender theory uh, to look at uh, uh, nuclear, nuclear deterrence. There are many masculine uh, wordings in the nuclear deterrence theories. That uh, is actually led to the fixation of the uh, theory of uh, nuclear deterrence. Therefore, she's taking a different approach, a new approach to deal with this. So thank you very much. That was very interesting.
ですね。えー uh, next is Sizwe from South Africa. 大学というところの講師をされています。Um, he is a lecturer at Witwatersland University.、Uh, please start. Thank you very much,、uh, Professor Nishida. And let me also just say, even people in South Africa find it hard to pronounce my many different names. So, no fear. Also, to、uh, Governor Yuzaki, thank you very much for hosting us. Uh, Arigato koizaimasu. I'd like to make two main points in my brief reflections. The first is to offer some explorations on the country that I come from, South Africa, and the country that we're in today, Japan, and what both of those countries mean for the question of nuclear politics globally. Because I believe that both countries share a unique place in the global nuclear order and in the history of nuclear weapons. And then, having spoken about the country that I come from and the country that we are currently in, I then like to speak about this question of deterrence and pick up on some of the conversations that were had in the previous panel about. This idea of alternatives and the extent to which we can imagine alternatives from our particular vantage point in history. So, as far as Japan and South Africa are concerned, our two countries are very seldom linked together. South Africa is very far away from here, as I can attest, having travelled a long distance quite recently. We're very seldom spoken of together, but we share a very important role in the history of nuclear weapons. It was particularly striking for me to be here for the first time to visit the memorial today and to experience and understand the impact and legacy of the first time that nuclear weapons were used in war where we are. And so Japan is unique as the only country. That has had to witness and experience and overcome the devastation of the use of nuclear weapons in war. By contrast, South Africa is unique as the only country to have voluntarily given up and dismantled a nuclear weapons program. This is something many people in South Africa don't know about South Africa, and many people in the world don't know about South Africa. That South Africa had nuclear weapons and it decided to get rid of them. Now, other countries in Eastern Europe also transferred their nuclear weapons away Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan. But South Africa is unique to the extent that it had nuclear weapons and it dismantled its program. It no longer has those weapons. So, Japan is the place where we learned what the destruction of nuclear weapons can do. And South Africa is the place where we learned that it's not impossible to get rid of nuclear weapons. And I think the conversation between those two countries, which is very seldom had in nuclear scholarship and in nuclear discussions more generally, is an important conversation that we need to initiate between those two countries, but also more, more globally. Having said that, What does that mean for the future of deterrence, and how does that relate to the broader discussion that we've already embarked on? And I was struck by this question, which is something I think we're all grappling with ultimately about how do we begin to envisage and imagine alternatives to the current status quo? And the first thing I would say about that is that we don't have to. Reinvent the wheel just yet because the first set of alternatives are the alternatives that already exist. We don't have to imagine some new thing into being. Actually, there are alternatives in the world right now. And then we do have to engage in the creative work of imagining what alternatives don't exist that might exist, which is maybe the more challenging. 
and the more creative and maybe the more fun thing to do. But my work focuses in large part on the alternatives that already do exist. And one of the key alternatives is what are called nuclear weapon free zones. These are places in the world where states have come together to say that we will not use nuclear weapons on our territory. And quite impressively, even some nuclear weapon states have said, we agree and we will not use nuclear weapons on that territory. So those alternatives do exist, but they exist in places you wouldn't ex expect that aren't normally spoken about when we speak about nuclear politics. In Africa, in my continent, in Latin America, in the South Pacific, places where nuclear weapons have been tested, places which also have a history of the testing of nuclear weapons, have resisted against the logic of deterrence. And I think, although we can't learn everything from those places, we also can't learn nothing from them. And so the question is, what have those nuclear weapon-free zones done that in a distant future, other states in the world might be able to replicate? So there are alternatives, and we need to take them seriously before we dismiss them out of hand. But then finally, what are the alternatives that we haven't yet imagined? And for me, this is kind of like trying to walk in mist. You can't actually see your next step, but you have to try and imagine it as you take that step. And for all of us, I think that is a pressing intellectual and political goal. What I would say on that is that we also don't have to put the pressure on ourselves to assume that everything would happen at once because the nuclear age didn't happen at once. First there was technology, then there was one nuclear weapon state, then there were three, then there were five. We now have nine and there is extended deterrence. So an alternative won't happen overnight, but I think the question is what are the steps over a period of time that could create an alternative to deterrence? To go from nine nuclear weapon states to eight, and then just to sit there, and then to sit from eight to seven, and seven to four. So all I would say in the creation of alternatives, as I conclude, is that we don't need to imagine an immediate alternative. We need to imagine an alternative that would evolve and grow over time, just as the problem of nuclear weapons evolved and grew over time. And hopefully in the Q&A, we can start to flesh out what this unseen and future alternative might look like. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sizwe. Um, already, uh, there is uh, the nuclear weapon-free zone as uh, the alternative that exists in this world. We don't have to create, or we don't have to invent the wheels. Uh, so there are things that we can learn from this uh, nuclear weapon-free zone. That is a very important point. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, uh. Uh, thank you. Then I would like to invite uh, Dr. Matthew Harris. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I said that my first job was the easy one because I could criticize other people's ideas. Now I have to give my ideas. Uh, but I'm very excited because I have the opportunity to talk about a project that my organization, RUSI, and myself uh, will be starting in the coming months uh, with the Hiroshima Organization for Global Peace and Hiroshima Prefecture. Uh, which is on a research project on envisioning uh, a security system without reliance on nuclear deterrence. So I'm also glad to have uh, uh, to be speaking now because I feel like I can pick up uh, some of the questions which my co-panelists have already started um, talking about. Uh, this project uh, really starts from 
a, uh, a um, an observation um, that I think um, that Ananya um, articulated uh, in the first uh, session, uh, which is that um, regardless of what you think about the effects of nuclear deterrence, whether nuclear deterrence serves security or not, uh, practicing nuclear deterrence involves risk. Uh, unavoidably, there is no way to deter effectively without uh, threatening the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, that is risk. And that risk, over time, in more regions, um, with more actors, with more technologies, is likely to lead, at some point, to the use of nuclear weapons. So the question is, starting from some kind of common ground, if we can share a conception of that risk among a broad community of actors, can we think about what security would look like? But the reason I was asking some of those uh, uh, challenging questions in the first session is that from my point of view, there will need to be answers to, and clear answers to some of the uh, existing security concerns of states in the system as it is now, in the global system as it is now, otherwise we will never make progress towards those goals. So even if we think these are the wrong questions and the wrong way of looking at the world and that security should mean something else, unless we have clear answers to some of those questions, we can't change it. So this is the starting point. If you go back uh, f 10, 15 years, there was a moment um, between something like 2007 and 2012 where it seemed like there was a shared sense uh, globally uh, that nuclear disarmament was necessary and that there was a moment, there was a window of opportunity, there was a chance to make progress. There were high profile articles by influential figures. Um, President Obama uh, made a speech in Prague uh, committing the United States to a world without nuclear weapons. And various uh, distinguished panels studied this problem and issued uh, reports and commissions and technical studies of various kinds, uh, including the, the Hiroshima for Global Peace Plan of, of um, uh, Governor Yusaki. Um, Fifteen years later, the world has gone in exactly the opposite direction, that in all the regions of the world where nuclear weapons already exist, their role has increased. Um, and they are more important in security relationships, not less important. And so it's clear to see that a huge driving factor of that is so-called great power relations, the relations between the United States and Russia, relations between the United States and China have got dramatically worse. But why is it that as those relations got worse, we couldn't separate the relationship from nuclear weapons? Why did the role of nuclear weapons um, grow at the same time? Um, I think in that moment, 10, 15 years ago, and, what, uh, and, and in the years following it, um, you could see two types of plans for nuclear disarmament being offered. One type of plan was about the process of nuclear disarmament. Um, what would you have to do to bring down numbers of nuclear weapons? What treaties would you have to sign to control nuclear weapons? Um, what technical uh, measures would you need to um, verify nuclear disarmament agreements. How do you technically work out that a country has dismantled um, its a, a nuclear warhead without showing secret information to the people looking at it? So one 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 set of plans was was about the process. How do you how do you get there? And many of these commissions and studies laid out the series of steps that would have to happen. So uh, uh, a new 
treaty between the US and Russia, a t the test ban treaty coming into force, a treaty to cut off fissile material, and so on, a series of steps. And then another movement came alongside that, which focused on delegitimizing nuclear weapons, stigmatizing nuclear weapons. And that process led to the negotiation of the TPNW, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which is to say that to make it clear that nuclear weapons are unacceptable and to encourage governments to change policy, to encourage institutions to divest from nuclear weapons financing from citizens, to, to, to protest against uh, the practice of nuclear deterrence and so on. Um, but neither of those um, types of plan for nuclear disarmament, uh, in my view, um, really proposed uh, an alternative a security alternative to the role that nuclear weapons played at that moment in time. Then there were uh, many critiques of uh, the functioning of nuclear deterrence. There were um, uh, there were some assumptions that the world had changed and nuclear weapons were less relevant, but there was less emphasis on saying here is how security in a nuclear-free world for these countries that rely on nuclear weapons would work. So, that's the, the idea of this project is to say, okay, what is that security system? What is that? And, and the reason for it is to start from the idea that you have to persuade uh, decision makers, members of the public, um, uh, uh, politicians, who believe in nuclear deterrence now, that there is another way to ensure the security of their people uh, without uh, nuclear weapons and without uh, extended deterrence. Um, so, I, I, the, um, so I, I, I don't want to go on too long. I, maybe I can just, um, s to give you a little idea of how this uh, project will work, maybe I can just quickly mention the big three research questions which we will be looking at um, and trying to, to report on. And if anyone is interested in more detail, please come and, and, and grab me and I, I will be happy to talk to you. Uh, or we can email and I can share more, more details about it. But the, the big three questions are this. Question one, what functions do nuclear weapons currently serve in regional security contexts? where nuclear weapons exist today. So in what we could call the Euro-Atlantic, so the US, Russia, NATO um, a relationship, in the Indo-Pacific, uh, and in the Middle East. The question one is, what, 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 what role do nuclear weapons play in security in those regions now? Question two is, what alternatives are available um, that could f fulfill these functions, play this role in those regions? So, for example, are there non-nuclear military capabilities that can simply replace what nuclear weapons do now? Or um, are there ways of changing regional security so that those roles are not necessary anymore? So, for example, through collective security arrangements like alliances um, or through limits on conventional military forces. And then question three is, uh, it's really what Sizwe was talking about at the end. How far into the, into the fog, into the mist, can we step before you have answers to all these questions? Because the, the natural conservatism, the natural pessimism of uh, leaders is not to take risks with their country's security. So how, to what extent can you reduce the role of nuclear weapons um, in state security policies before you have those replacements, those alternatives uh, that we're talking about. So I, I will leave it there. I very much look forward to uh, uh, questions and um, hope to be here in uh, a year and a half's time uh, with some answers. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Uh, Matthew Harris, 
Yeah, in the previous session, uh, the, there was a reference to the opening of the space to introduce the alternatives, as Hassan mentioned. And uh, but uh, 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 Dr. Harris, uh, the existing uh, plans do not offer uh, alternatives, uh, and. Uh, uh, we, uh, also, the concerns, security concerns, has to be uh, addressed to find out new alternatives. And next, over to you, Tambi. Thank you. Um, so, I'm going to sp be speaking about themes for rethinking nuclear deterrence, um, and much of my remarks are drawn from my own academic research, but also the research and the projects that we are doing at APLN. So. The Asia-Pacific. The Asia-Pacific is home to six of the world's nine nuclear armed states and major nuclear alliances. It is also a region troubled by geopolitical tensions, active military conflicts, overlapping territorial claims, growing hypernationalism and extremism, and the risks of WMD terrorism. It is a region without any strategic nuclear policy dialogues, whether bilateral or multilateral, nor any regional organizations that um, can moderate interstate nuclear relations. The four nuclear armed states which are in Asia are also the four out of eight CTBT Annex II holdout states. These, uh, three of these are outside the missile uh, technology control regime and the Hague Code of Conduct, and all of them except China are sitting outside the NPT. All the nuclear tests conducted since 1996, since the adoption of the CTBT, have um, taken place in the Asia-Pacific, um, and concerns still persist that the DPRK might test more nuclear weapons. So the region is basically characterized by complex nuclear deterrence relations, um, such as trilateral security equations between countries like India, Pakistan, and China, or for that matter, between China, the US, and the DPRK which have intersecting elements of cooperation and conflict, uh, expanding nuclear stockpiles and conventional weaponry, ambitious st space programs, nuclear and non-nuclear entanglements, and asymmetries in capabilities as well as perceptions of risks. And so the Asia-Pacific is a uniquely complex and dynamic region which offers critical insights into contemporary deterrence thinking and decision making. So my first intervention to the theme of rethinking nuclear deterrence is that the Asia-Pacific is indispensable to rethinking nuclear deterrence. The significance of the Asia-Pacific to uh, global geopolitics, to the current international security, uh, to the 21st century global nuclear order, makes it um, central to investigating the practical, theoretical, and uh, political underpinnings that inform nuclear doctrines, policies, alliance relationships, and strategic competition across the region as well as globally. And I mean this not just as an academic exercise, but also as a policy exercise. So to rethink nuclear deterrence, we need to understand how states in the Asia Pacific think about nuclear deterrence. This also means building a better understanding about how different stakeholders and constituencies within the Asia Pacific think about nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence. It means um, also looking at and carefully assessing uh, the perceptions of risks and intentions, domestic nuclear weapons debates and philosophical ideas, as well as the emergent military hardware and, te and software technologies uh, on nuclear policies and doctrines. The Asia-Pacific especially needs a lot more policy dialogues and conversations on perception gaps and confidence-building measures at both the official political and military levels, but also civil society levels. Second, but related to this first intervention, is a continuous and better understanding of the costs, consequences, and the implications of nuclear weapons use. And these would include not just military, political, and humanitarian impacts, but also environmental impacts, ecological costs, climate impacts, um, and many other invisible costs, uh, like individual trauma, social trauma, intergenerational or multi-generational health impacts. I think this would not only help push efforts toward nuclear risk reduction, but also toward uh, universal nuclear disarmament. 
like I said in the previous session, there is a need to question the vocabulary of nuclear deterrence. What is credibility of nuclear deterrence, for instance? Is it simply that the threat of use of nuclear weapons will be implemented under specific circumstances? Or does it also mean that the nuclear armed states will do everything in their capacity not to let deterrence break down? Take another question. How do we define, how do we define the use of nuclear weapons? Is it only the first or the retaliatory use as an act of aggression against an adversary? Or does exposing populations and environment to nuclear tests with or without their consent also constitute nuclear use against them? At APLN, we're, running, we're currently running two projects that address these themes. Uh, the first is a collaborative project with um, RECNA and uh, the Nautilus Institute uh, on uh, modeling new possible nuclear use case scenarios in Northeast Asia, uh, and also looking at a range of, uh, and quantifying a range of humanitarian impacts um, in each of these nuclear use cases. The other project is uh, on exploring the relationship between the Anthropocene, the climate crisis, and the legacy of nuclear weapons testing in the Pacific Islands. And through various creative formats, our participants from the Pacific Island states are articulating how contemporary uh, nuclear weapons policies and practices of nuclear armed states continue to exacerbate their suffering and the security risks to the Pacific Island communities. The third intervention would be about norms, and this is inspired from my own um, academic research. Now, we know that norms have a way of uh, structuring interests and um, regulating behaviors, and we also know that interests, practices, and behaviors of states um, are in turn shape and constitute and modify international norms. Like I was saying in the previous session, uh, nuclear myth-making and nuclear deterrence go hand in hand. And so an important theme in rethinking nuclear deterrence should be to strengthen international norms and meta-norms that bust nuclear myths and move states away from a reliance on nuclear deterrence. It means strengthening the norm of nuclear non-proliferation, but also the norm of responsible ownership of nuclear weapons, um, just as important as strengthening the prohibitory norm or the nuclear taboo and nuclear myth-busting. I think an important uh, 20th century example of this is the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice on the legality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons of July 1996, after which negative security assurances emerged as a kind of customary international law um, reflecting the norm of non-use of nuclear weapons. And in the 21st century, the TPNW uh, has been a critical intervention in contesting the social and political construction of value to nuclear weapons. Finally, um, taking inspiration from my own interest in art, but um, also reinforced by um, the kind of visuals that I took in yesterday um, on my little trip around the, the memorial, the Hiroshima memorial, um, I think rethinking nuclear deterrence uh, will need not just new thinking, but also creativity. And what I mean by creativity here is a little different. That means not only accounting for changes and novelties um, that have emerged in the post-Cold War period, uh, not just adding new lenses to add more perspective uh, to nuclear deterrence thinking. Um, it's not just about asking the nuclear policy discourse to be more inclusive by adding aspects of um, gender and race and culture, etc. It's not only pointing to the limitations, the theoretical and practical limitations of the deterrence doctrine, Creativity would mean using innovative tools and creative tools to do all of these beyond the written text. And so it would mean uh, using, involving poetry, literature, the visual media, um, performing arts, music, fine arts, designing, in explaining and exploring how we can move beyond deterrence. I think the academic and the policy community should not be shy from using these powerful tools to question, critique, and innovate ideas and practices in international relations. At APLN, we're taking these small and gradual steps through our own research and engagement. Um, as a parting note, I would encourage all of you to please go on our website, and under the, the, under the project of Voices from the Pacific Islands, 
uh, please read five very powerful and evocative poems that have been written by uh, five women from the Pacific Islands um, talking about their experience in the nuclear age. And this is what I would mean by being creative with our rethinking nuclear deterrence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tamni. It's going beyond the conventional nuclear deterrence. So we need to look at the uh, intersections uh, with some uh, health, environment, and also the taking advantage of creativity, art and applying art to go beyond the uh, nuclear deterrence. That was quite a new approach. Thank you very much. Lastly, Ananya. So much uh, to my co-panelists for those fascinating presentations. It's a privilege to be able to go last and reflect on all of your amazing contributions. Um, so I'd like to speak a little bit about the project I mentioned in the first panel that I'm a part of at NTI, which is called Horizon 2045. And so this is uh, not a part of the working group, but we will certainly be benefiting from all of your findings and research and, and hoping to draw from them in the non-academic sphere. So Horizon 2045 is co-founded by NTI, uh, the Nuclear Threat Initiative in Washington, D.C., as well as our partners at N Square, based in San Francisco, and the Center for Complexity at the Rhode Island School of Design, which is one of the premier institutions of art and design, to uh, Tanvi's last point here, uh, in the U.S. So I'd like to share some of the work we've done with our interdisciplinary in interdisciplinary approach to map out the nuclear weapons system and understand the role of nuclear deterrence within that system and why we think a new approach to security is necessary. Uh, so I think this presentation will touch on several of the themes that have been mentioned already. But Horizon 2045 launched in 2020 in, res in response and recognition to the fact that the nuclear threat is just one that humanity is facing and confronting amongst a proliferation of existential challenges from pandemics to emerging technologies and above all the climate crisis that our current institutions and governments and structures are not designed to address. So this is emerging from a concern that we're on the wrong path for the security of our planet and that we need to reimagine our definitions of global security and security uh, more generally without nuclear weapons and to begin to take those steps into the mist tentatively but in a rigorous way uh, and to take actions to safeguard both present and future generations. And so, in a way, this is a slightly different argument for disarmament than the ones that Matthew laid out, but it builds on both. And we'd like to think of this as kind of a 21st century approach to global security. So core to this work are three approaches which have informed us. And so these are uh, somewhat novel paradigms to be including in, uh, in nuclear policy, but we think they're important. So first is a systems approach to look at the global nuclear weapons system as a structure and what are its drivers, incentives, behaviors that underlie it, motivate it, keep it going in place. And also importantly, where there are levers, potential levers for change, and where we might build work on those parts of the system. Second, uh, drawing from the discipline of strategic foresight and futures to reimagine a future without nuclear weapons. What might this world look like from an institutional, legal perspective? What might it feel like to, uh, again, to that point about creativity and making people understand and make tangible and real a potential world without nuclear weapons, especially in response to those who say that such a world is far off in a different future, in a different world that looks very unlike ours today. Third, we seek, and, and, and perhaps most foundationally, is the effort to understand how our continued reliance on nuclear weapons impacts our collective ability to manage other risks especially global risks like climate change to which global cooperation is absolutely essential. And so one thing that's clear is solving any of the, is that addressing any of these global threats will require the inclusion of a wide range of voices beyond those who have been traditionally included in such policy conversations, especially and most importantly those who are harmed by current practices and threats. 
and this has been touched on by my co-panelists, that the tent of us who are working towards nuclear disarmament, thinking about it, writing about it, creating art about it, should be much wider to include creative storytellers, designers, artists, and futurists. And this is a core belief of Horizon 2045. So we've done work and are trying to commission um, uh, work from artists, creative writers, about what a future world without nuclear weapons might look like using the tools of creative speculation. Now to discuss some of the work we've done to date, as a first step, the Horizon 2045 team mapped out the nuclear weapons system and its key structures, incentives, and underlying belief systems at its core. So many of these were laid out brilliantly by Dr. Considine, so I won't replicate them here. But Mainly, especially in nuclear weapon states, these might pertain to factors like the military industrial complex and its associated financial incentives and profits from nuclear weapons contractors. But this also includes deeper seated paradigms, such as the foundational view that the earth is a resource for consumption and extraction rather than for protection and cohabitation and the belief that nuclear weapons can ensure dominance and have coercive power for political aims, which we see playing out in Ukraine. So this effort has helped us to visualize and get our hands around some key observations about the nuclear weapon system. First, as Matthew pointed out, that it is riddled with risk at its very core. Secondly, as, as Laura pointed out, that it creates and perpetuates deep injustice and inequality. And also, as has Tanvi pointed out, that it has internal mechanisms for resisting change. Um, and importantly, as I mentioned, it lets us explore where there might be leverage points where we can seek to disrupt these dynamics. But to spend some time on nuclear deterrence at the very center and core of that system, nuclear deterrence is what is continuously used to justify a buildup of more advanced weapons and massive spending on their modernization to ensure that credible threat. And we see this pattern that is in international relations called a security dilemma in Sioux. So rival countries perceive the buildup as threatening, geopolitical tensions worsen, thus there are more aggressive postures that are triggered. And this is what we see playing out between the US and China. And as a result, arms control is stalemated. Governments are distracted from addressing other evolving security challenges and cooperation on shared threats such as climate change is a non-starter. And so this circular logic of nuclear deterrence is what led to the buildup of 70,000 nuclear weapons during the Cold War as was brilliantly laid out in an earlier session. And in recent years, this has led to our multipolar nuclear arms race of $80 billion a year in global spending, which is money, as we know, better spent on climate mitigation and public health, amongst many other crises. And this, in a sense, uh, should be obvious, but from our systems approach, we've kind of understood that this shouldn't be surprising. It's a nuclear security system that is premised on the belief that the possession and credible threat to use nuclear weapons is key to security, by definition creates a dynamic that reinforces rather than reduces reliance on those weapons for its security. And this was um, kind of put by one of the questions in the earlier panel, well, if nuclear deterrence is, going, is key to keeping us safe, then more and more countries will want it. Is that not inevitable? Um, this kind of thinking traps us, nuclear deterrence traps us, in other words, in a forever moment from which there seems to be no exit from the security dilemma. So given the dominance of these reactive and adversarial modes of thinking, which dominate our discourse for the last 80 years, some of these uh, new novel approaches that have been outlined already are very important and we should build on them. We need new rigorous approaches that incorporate a diversity of understandings of security that are fit for purpose to today's challenges. And we need to explore new pathways to address these challenges and see how nuclear deterrence is a mode of security that is outdated, fundamentally. So Horizon 2045 is trying to make one small step towards this by bringing together a diverse and inter interdisciplinary team from both uh, with expertise both in the nuclear field as well as an external uh, fields such as design, architecture, futures, to explore existing and emerging political dynamics, legal structures, technologies, and institutional designs that might help us think about what a more cooperative international system might look like. 
and to map future systems and scenarios in which we might weave some of those structures together to address the threats that are confronting us all. So similar to how Dr. Albatimi put it in the first session, we hope that this effort sort of carves out a creative and critical space to identify signals that can help us get out of this self-fulfilling loop. Where are there signals in the present that might point to what might make disarmament more difficult in the future, but also more likely? For example, we think that working towards eliminating nuclear weapons can help us build the institutions, laws, norms, and platforms for trust and dialogue that are critical to managing other threats that are knocking on our door. And indeed, we believe that this goal should also be part of the process and arguments in favor of nuclear disarmament. And to that effect, we should absolutely be learning from other movements, such as efforts to address climate change in our own efforts towards disarmament so that we can continue to build connections between these two issue spaces. Two of our interventions, which I'll bring up since they relate a bit uh, to some of the other projects ongoing, one is on legal strategies. So what kinds of novel legal approaches might we draw from ongoing efforts in international law, specifically in climate, climate litigation, uh, to advance our efforts in disarmament? So we've seen some recent historic successes on the international stage by small island states, for example, the Torres Strait Islanders at the Human Rights Committee last September, and more recently Vanuatu, which succeeded in achieving, uh, in, in uh, obtaining, in submitting a request for the International Court of Justice to issue an, a similar advisory opinion on climate change and obligations for states. Some of these have very pertinent legal underpinnings which can be used for nuclear disarmament, such as, for example, the rights of future generations or the precautionary principle, which is a legal uh, uh, principle which requires us to take action in the face of uncertainty. So you can see how there's both material and philosophical overlap uh, between these two issue spaces and ongoing efforts to address them. We think we need to build more work here, build more connections. The second one, and uh, I'll uh, sorry. wrap. Could you? Yes, wrap up with this. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that one for now and happy to discuss it later, but just in conclusion, to echo uh, what's been, to wrap up what's been said, the world outside us is changing very quickly and safeguarding our future will require a very different understanding than we have now. We need an understanding of security that is not premised on adversarial mistrust and the buildup and modernization of military and defense budgets, but one that sees that our greatest security threats are not from each other, but from shared threats like nuclear war, pandemics, and climate change. And we need to work to address these as practical necessities for safeguarding our future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nuclear deterrence needs to be understood from the entire system. And security should also be looked at from the diverse perspectives. Thank you for your input. Uh, we will hope to, to move to the second round, but we would like to have a five-minute break and while we are open to the Q&As. Okay, then let's start the break. We will come back in five minutes. Uh, again, uh, the refreshment is available in the back of the room. And again, uh, we are accepting questions online. Please use a QR code or URL if you are participating online. Um, if you have any questions addressed to specific panelists, please identify that. And then please put if you are online questionnaire and then you uh, please specify that whether you are online participants or in-person participants. And do not forget to return uh, the simultaneous re uh, translation receivers when you leave the hall. Thank you. Uh, let us resume the session. Now we close the uh, 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 receiving questions and we would like to start Q&A. Uh, due to time constraint, we will not be able to answer all questions. Thank you very much for your understanding. Uh, Professor Nishida, thank you. I uh, think that we can spend 15 minutes. So let me kick off uh, first, and uh, I would like to raise a couple of questions, uh, followed by Q&A uh, from the floor. 
uh, uh, Lola, uh, um, you mentioned uh, the introduction of fe feminism perspective uh, in the nuclear uh, deterrent conversation. And in what way do you think we can introduce feminism idea into the discussion of a nuclear deterrent? Uh, she's where? Uh, well, uh, there are some alternatives to nuclear weapons, but uh, in Northeast Asia, uh, uh, there are some ideas to create a Northeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone, but it is not realized yet. Why do you think, uh, what are the barriers, impediments to prevent uh, the region to create a non nuclear weapon free zone? Matthew, uh, the, uh, you said the replacement by the conventional weapons uh, to, to replace the nuclear deterrence. Uh, what type of conventional weapons uh, do you think will be plausible replacement of nuclear weapons? What type of, uh, I would say, new conventional weapons do you think could be a replacement to uh, nuclear weapons or nuclear uh, deterrence? So these are three questions I would like to start with. Um, I think that there are very various ways in which feminism can be very valuable to um, trying to rethink or think beyond nuclear deterrence. Um, so first of all, it um, provides us with a way to think about and question some of our ideas um, about um, words that have been used on, on the stage today, things like dominance and aggression, um, and foundational ideas that nuclear weapons might keep us safe. Um, and think about how those are actually, um, might be thought through um, gendered ideas of um, masculinity or femininity, or the ideas that are the assumptions that um, thinking about nuclear weapons in terms of strategy and rationality and strength are masculine related values and, and therefore valued more highly than ideas about um, disarmament and peace, which you know tend to be dismissed sometimes as irrational or emotional. And so feminism can give us a way to um, challenge this or think through some of the assumptions um, embedded in this dismissing of um, ideas of disarmament and peace um, as of less value than ideas of strength and rationality. I think feminism also um, asks us to think about um, the margins of politics, who is not included uh, in high diplomacy and in strategy, whose voices are not heard. So um, who are the voices of, of victims, um, those who do not have any um, political power, those who have been silenced or excluded from debates. Feminism asks us to think about these voices and including them and seeing how important that they are. And feminism also asks us to think about bodies and harm and violence. Nuclear deterrence can be very abstract. Um, you know, the language of nuclear deterrence um, can be very sanitized and it doesn't really speak about violence and harm done to bodies. And I went to the museum today and, you know, it's very clear quite how much harm nuclear weapons um, do to bodies. And feminism's focus on the body and violence and identifying and making sure that that is seen, I think is very important um, for thinking about nuclear deterrence. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think one thing that distinguishes this region narrowly and more broadly defined is of course the presence of nuclear weapon states not only China, but also North Korea. And so I think we should be cautious not to suggest that just because nuclear weapon free zones worked in Africa, they will inevitably work everywhere. And that's why I said we should not think that we can't learn nothing from them, but also that we can replicate them everywhere. One thing that I think is interesting though, in pursuing that project is that most nuclear weapon free zones are united by a traumatic nuclear event which then provided the impetus for the creation of that zone. 
And one thing that I think is interesting is that in this region, with the use of nuclear weapons, we do have the existence of that kind of uh, ultimately traumatic event. In Africa, there was testing. In Latin America, it was the Cuban Missile Crisis. In the South Pacific, it was nuclear testing. And so perhaps the history of nuclear weapon use here suggests that that project might not be impossible in, in the long term. But if a nuclear weapon-free zone, it, I think a nuclear weapon-free zone is like the ultimate stage of an alternative. And that ultimate stage has been reached by some places. But even if you can't reach an ultimate stage, what are the intermediate stages? And so for me, one thing I've been thinking about a lot is if you can't get to a nuclear weapon free zone, that doesn't mean that you can, you stop relying less on deterrence. So is there a way to not even scrap deterrence, but place less reliance on deterrence? Or rather than having direct deterrence, move to more forms of indirect deterrence over time. So I think the question for me would be not wishing to leap to the ultimate stage, but what are the intermediate stages of a post-deterrence region? And, and then finally moving towards a nuclear weapon-free zone. And that's what we learned from Africa. First, South Africa had to disarm, and only then did the ultimate stage of a nuclear weapon-free zone um, materialize. But it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough question because the hard question is, could you have nuclear weapon-free zones where there are nuclear weapons? I think yes, but I think that would be quite a distant prospect and probably the hardest thing to achieve. So the more low-hanging fruits are the intermediate steps in between. Thank you very much. Uh, Matthew? Thank you. Uh, Nishida Sand, you asked me um, what conventional weapons could potentially substitute for nuclear weapons. I suppose question one is um, how many of the roles for nuclear weapons currently would fall away if uh, the other side had no nuclear weapons? So many targets are simply the, the other side's nuclear forces. So those essentially wouldn't exist in a, in a world without nuclear weapons. And then the question is, of the other targets that those nuclear weapons are aimed at, what, could, what weapons could you use to, to hold those targets at risk, as they say? Uh, the most obvious uh, example is long-range um, conventional um, precision strike missiles, um, where the idea is that because uh, as missiles get more accurate, um, they don't need to be as explosive as a nuclear weapon, which would previously have been used because you don't have to get it so close to blow the thing up, basically. Um, it's possible that missile defenses could be part of this answer because you use your own missile defenses to remove some threats on the other side. It's possible that then other so-called emerging uh, areas of capability could be relevant, such as space or cyber. But I would say it's very likely that you cannot simply substitute non-nuclear weapons for what nuclear weapons currently do. And so you have to think about other ways of transforming um, security structures. So you know, answers to these difficult questions of how would you stop one state acquiring a disproportionate amount of uh, power and capability and imposing its will on a smaller state is the answer to that. You know, strengthened collective security arrangements, alliances uh, that do rely on conventional military force. Um, do you, and, and the other half of it is probably what limitations through non-nuclear arms control can you place on the, the military capabilities that, that others can build up. So I think there's, there may be some scope for conventional or non-nuclear weapons to directly replace nuclear weapons, but it's very likely that they, 
that you cannot, it won't be simply substituting one for the other. And there where I think that there are a range of perspectives is to what extent do you have to fundamentally transform the idea of what security means in order to, to do that? Or can you have a, an approximate idea of what security means today, but achieve through other, um, other mechanisms? Or can you persuade um, states that an increased level of risk is worth it to get rid of nuclear weapons? And maybe one scenario where that might happen would be after nuclear weapons are used again. If that happens, um, and if that demonstrates the costs and impacts of nuclear use um, in a way that fundamentally changes how, how people think. But I don't think we know what would happen if that, if that was the case. Thank you. We are running out of time. Uh, then I would like to accommodate several questions from the floor. The first, first question. Such as cyber attacks, terrorism, and regional conflict. How can we obtain the latest evidence of merit, demerit of possessing nuclear weapons? How can we develop necessary evidence to promote nuclear deterrence? I guess this is a comment. The, the power of the nuclear weapons is the basis for nuclear deterrence. Therefore, by taking advantage of the Hibakusha humanity, we can challenge the um, nuclear deterrent theory. Okay. Well, the Tanvi and then Nyanya. So those are the questions uh, for um, maybe no uh, for any of you. So if you can make some comment on those questions. Thank you. Um, so on the the evidence, uh, how do we gather evidence for uh, the merits and? the demerits of nuclear deterrence. And I think um, exercises such as the one that uh, the Belfast Center is uh, doing um, is, uh, is basically one such exercise and exactly doing this, a gathering evidence of the merits and demerits of nuclear deterrence. Um, it is relying on um, the extensive, exhaustive research that has uh, that is being done since since the past decades, uh, but also looking at, um, like I said, uh, looking at narratives from different parts of the world to understand um, whether there is merit in nuclear deterrence. But this is again um, a very hard question to answer, so I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I am very inspired by the comment on taking inspiration from the Hibakusha community. Um, and just to sort of uh, circle back to one of uh, the points that we were discussing about um, education and um, educating people, I feel that um, this is often said that we need to educate um, civilians and, and people. Um, we also need to think whether um, you know, political leaders across the world, especially political leaders of countries uh, who have nuclear weapons, are they completely educated about the effects, the costs, and implications of nuclear weapons? So along with um, education of the people, we also need to invest in educating political leaders. Um, and I think uh, using narratives, experiences, uh, but also, like I said, um, using all forms of creative arts to, to educate political leaders is also very important. Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. Yes, um, so on combining sort of the last two questions about, uh, you know, the power of nuclear deterrence as well as, as, well as evidence, um, I think to, to bring up something that I think Matthew mentioned in your presentation that nuclear wep there is no other weapon that can do what nuclear weapons can do. I think we need to interrogate this idea of the qualitative evidence of the realities of nuclear violence and ask 
and put this to the test. Do we want a weapon that can achieve these kinds of horrific and inhumane consequences? And to Professor Considine's point about desanitizing nuclear policy and putting the body back into nuclear policy, we can have a conversation that's rigorous and informed about the actual effects of nuclear violence, both the immediate ones and the potential follow-on ones as well as the ongoing impacts that we see from nuclear development and use, et cetera. But um, yes, I think that we do need a kind of rigorous conversation which holds the, feet, holds the feet of deterrence to the fire, so to speak, that says, is the uniqueness of nuclear weapons value in the incredibly inhumane harm that they cause? Well, let's have a conversation about that then and, uh, and how this informs our postures and strategies. Uh, NTI is also working on this subject on a project on global catastrophic consequences of nuclear effects, which I think overlaps and, and, and we can learn from the APLN's ongoing project about uh, scenarios in Northeast Asia. Our work is more about the policy consequences that pol current present day policymakers should take into account when considering the potential economic, social, and climatic effects of a nuclear conflict. Uh, we've seen recent updated research that, de that uh, develops and builds on the research from the 1980s on nuclear winter, but there is much more to be done to understand what are the, ca the cascading effects on critical infrastructure, economies, public health, uh, the environment, supply chains, etc. And so I think this is one, one important avenue for further empirical evidence and research to be gathered. Thanks. Yeah, まあ、ちょっと何,何かこう取りまとめるとかないんですけども、まあ、今日の議論を聞いていて私が思ったのは。Well, thank you very much.、Uh, well, after the,、uh, listening to the discussion, I believe、uh, there are two approaches. First one is to involve the various、uh, viewpoints into the、uh, discussions of the nuclear deterrence so that we are able to、uh, relativize the theory of the nuclear deterrence. In addition to it,、uh, we need to look at the、uh, Security policymakers, so in order to be persuaded against the、uh, security policymakers within the current framework of their security, how、uh, we can propose the alternatives. So we need to take on two an approaches. This is a very challenging、um, issue, however, that、uh, through these approaches、uh, we might be able to find a、uh, new way to.、Uh, Reach to a solution. So that was quite a challenging discussion, but we wish to continue the discussion going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you once again, Professor Nishida. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, all the panelists, for your contribution to our sessions. And also those who have joined. Inside, and also those who have joined online, thank you very much for taking your time to join us. And please、uh, make sure that you、uh, fill in the questionnaire to give us your feedback. So, those who are joining online,、uh, there is a Google form on the screen. So, please fill in the questionnaires through that means. And also, those who are joining on site, please make sure you return back your translation receivers on the way out. Thank you very much.